Hey, my name is Mike Klein, senior pastor here at Mountain View Church, and I'm just really grateful that you're taking a few minutes out of your life uh, to learn more about this place. The reality is, no matter where you're at in your life, uh, whatever age, whatever stage you find yourself in, I think Mountain View is the kind of place that you can belong, where you can find real people who are trying to discover a real God and are just on various stages in their life uh, taking steps towards Him. So feel free to check it out a little more. Uh, look around the website, contact the office if you want any more questions. Um, but really the best way to get plugged in and the best way to experience what this place is all about and why so many of us have chosen Mountain View as our spiritual home is to come and just check it out for yourself. So we hope to see you soon. Good morning, church. I'm so glad you were able to join us online this morning. Before we get started in worship, I'm going to read a blessing over you. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. In the Passion, Passion Translation, that last verse says, Now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church in every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. So this morning, we're going to offer up to God all the glorious praise because he is so worthy of everything we have to offer him.
never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working you never stop you
Lord, we just lift up our praise to you. Lord, we want to turn our hearts toward you this morning. We want to be receptive and responsive to whatever it is that you want to speak to us. Lord, customize Mike's message to fit whatever it is that you want to say to me this morning. I love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to this week's service. If you're new to Mountain View, welcome. We are so glad you chose to join us. We want you to know we are praying for you and we are here for you. To stay up to date with the latest announcements, please visit us on our website at mtviewchurch.net. There you will find links to request help or prayer during the COVID-19 quarantine, or you can request information about ways to help people in our community during this time. You can also find links for online giving and our previous sermon podcasts. And make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. We will have content throughout the week to help you grow in your relationship with God and remain in community with others. As we get ready for the sermon, you can find notes and links for this week's service on the YouVersion Bible app. Just go to the More icon on the bottom right in the app, click on Events, and search for Mountain View Church to follow along with the sermon. Well, hello, my name is Mike Klein, lead pastor at Mountain View Church, and uh, whether you're catching this live online right now or watching it later, uh, let me just say I am sincerely grateful that you're tuning in and worshiping with us today. Uh, We're actually in week six of a series we started way back before all of this uh, coronavirus craziness. Can can anybody even remember what what life was like uh, a few weeks ago? Um, Those were the days, right? Those Those were good days, like... Uh, you could actually sit in a restaurant and eat your food. Do you remember that? You remember what that was like? Do you remember uh, going to the grocery store and seeing a pack of Charmin and not salivating? Do you remember those days? Uh, my kids, you know, now they, they, they play with their neighbors by yelling across the fence. That's what playtime with friends has become. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were going to celebrate Easter down at Aldersgate. Remember that? We, we had just announced that as a church. And obviously, that's not going to happen now, right? We've had to make a few adjustments. I think we've come to grips with the reality that that is uh, not going to be the case. Maybe we'll try it next year. But what I want to make clear is, is just because we can't gather together in a building doesn't mean we can't celebrate. In fact, we have to, right? We must celebrate Easter. Our, our lack of ability to get in a building does not change the fact that the tomb is empty. It doesn't change that. It doesn't change the fact that Jesus is just as alive today as he was three or four weeks ago as he was 2,000 years ago. And so church, we must celebrate. We don't have an option. Right, we have to worship. We have to celebrate. And so we're going to try to help you do that at home uh, the best we can. We understand this will be a little bit of a different Easter, uh, but God is still worthy of our worship. And so uh, if you go to our website right now, it's mtviewchurch.net. Uh, it'll be there on the screen. And you'll find a video for each day of this week. And those videos are uh, eyewitness accounts from different uh, characters in the Bible story detailing uh, the Holy Week, we call it. It starts on Palm Sunday, which actually is today, and goes all the way to next week, 
uh, all the way to Easter. And so like this week, for instance, on Palm Sunday, it is a, a video of a man who was the owner of the donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on. So there's a video there uh, for each day of this week. There's a discussion guide if you want to click on that and um, dive into some of that, maybe with your family, maybe on your own. Um, And then on Good Friday, which is next Friday, after you watch the video, there's also um, some instructions there on how to take communion at home. And you're certainly welcome to use whatever drink and bread you have there. But if you're feeling up for it, we've actually got a recipe on there to make some unleavened bread. If you'd like to, to give that a shot, that would have been closer at least, a little bit closer to what Jesus and his disciples would have used. So take communion on Friday. And then um, the other thing we're doing this entire week, starting right after you're done watching this, is we are asking people to post a 60-second story on social media of how Jesus has changed your life really short, just 60 seconds of how Jesus has made a difference in your life, and then just use the hashtag, hashtag Jesus Changed My Life 2020. And we're going to find those and collect those and show those together as a church. Um, there's actually a couple examples on the website if you want to kind of check that out and, and see what we're going for. Um, but do that, hashtag Jesus Changed My Life 2020. And then, of course, the next Sunday is Easter. And we'll be doing this at 10 a.m. right here on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching this. So invite somebody to join you for worship. And again, all of this is available on our website if you want to check that out. But again, I just just want to affirm to you, uh, we must worship. We are not taking Easter off. We are not taking a week off because Jesus is alive. And he's just as alive in your home as he is in a church building. So, So worship him this Easter. So let's get into today's message. We are in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7 today. And uh, in this series, we're looking at the seven letters that Jesus wrote his church. And we're finally to a city you've heard of. Right? As we've been going through this, you probably weren't all that familiar with like Sardis or Thyatira, for example. But you've probably heard of Philadelphia. The problem is that it's not that Philadelphia. This is not a city in Pennsylvania. Um, this is not where the, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was born and raised, you know. Um, on the playground is where he spent most of his days chilling. Okay, I'll stop. Um, this is not that Philadelphia, right? This is a city in what is now modern-day Turkey. And it was founded by Attalus II, who happened to be the king of Pergamum, which is a town we talked about just a few weeks ago. And maybe you've heard Philadelphia, even here in the United States, is referred to sometimes as the city of brotherly love. And the reason for that is because Philadelphia in Greek literally means brotherly love. And so this city was actually named um, for the bond that Attalus shared with his brother Eumenes II. And so that's kind of where Philadelphia comes from. Something else you need to know about Philadelphia it was an agricultural hotspot. It was known for having some of the most fertile soil in the land because it sat at the base of a volcanic range. And so you could grow almost anything in the area, especially grapes. So it was famous for its vineyards and, and all of these crops. And I thought of that. I thought, you know, it's kind of like the Willamette Valley, right? It was in these mountain ranges, except they were volcanoes. And that's something else that you need to know. Right, that it was famous for earthquakes. In fact, in 17 AD, there was a massive quake with, get this, aftershocks that lasted for 20 years. 20 years. And so the citizens of Philadelphia lived in kind of this constant state of, of uncertainty and anxiety, never knowing when the next tremor would happen, never knowing when when everything they just finally had rebuilt would again be destroyed. And so the the people, again, they lived in this constant state of of worry and uncertainty. But you know what grows in uncertainty? It was an agricultural area. They would have been familiar with this language. You know what grows in uncertainty? Faith. Uncertainty is the fertile soil of faith. At some point in my life, I'm going to get this. I'm going to come to realize that 
no matter how much I plan and no matter how much I scheme and try to make things work, sometimes in the middle of my plans, life happens. Right? Things rarely go the way that you expect or that you plan. And I'm thinking about the situation now with, with COVID-19. Um, people have been asking me, you know, Mike, how are you doing? How is the church doing? And my default answer most of the time has been, I'm just taking it hour by hour. You know, and I honestly, I don't like that answer. I wish I had everything mapped out. I wish I knew exactly where we're going. The, the problem is in this situation, things are changing so rapidly that the plan that worked yesterday probably won't work tomorrow. And so there's a sense of always being on edge, like not quite knowing where we're going or, or how things are going to work out. And that kind of hour by hour uncertainty produces anxiety, or at least it does in me. And I'm guessing if you're watching this, a lot of you, have experienced that. But that's where faith grows. I don't like it. But faith grows in the soil of uncertainty because if everything was certain, right, if you had everything mapped out and you could control everything that happens in your life, you wouldn't need faith. Uncertainty is the soil of faith. And so Jesus is riding to this anxious, uncertain city of Philadelphia and and I want you to listen to what he says, because maybe this is what he's saying to you today. He says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write this. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. See, the first thing that Jesus reminds them of, I think the first thing that you and I need in uncertain times is what's true. Right? When, when things are shaky around us, we need to know what can I hold on to, what is real, what is true. And so Jesus writes them and he says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. Right, Jesus is reminding them that he is the Messiah from the line of David. Right? That goes all the way back into the Old Testament prophecies of where the Messiah was to come from. He says, I am holy and true. Like You can hang your hat on that. You can stand on that. You can trust that because I have the authority alone. I have the keys and I have control over who goes in and out of my kingdom. Right? I hold the keys. In fact, he says, I've opened a door for you, Philadelphia. Right? I've opened a door. He says, I, I know things maybe feel a little shaky right now, pun intended, for Philadelphia. But he says, there's an opportunity in front of you if you'll see it and walk through it. And I think this is important for us to understand because in moments of crisis like the one that we're in, it's easy to see all of the obstacles and miss the opportunities. Isn't that true? Right, when you feel like you're on shaky ground and everything's uncertain and you're not sure, it's easy to see all of the obstacles and miss the opportunities. That's a danger that you and I are facing right now. And I know that there are real problems. Okay, believe me, I'm not trying to minimize things. I, I know that there's financial strain. I realize that there are some serious health concerns for you, perhaps, even as you're watching this, or for family members. I, I know there's lots of struggle and problems. And I'm not trying to bury my, hand in the, uh, bury my head in the sand to pretend that that doesn't exist. But I don't want to make the opposite mistake where I bury my head in the problems to where I can't see any of the opportunities. Because there are opportunities, right? Even in the middle of this, God is opening doors. I cannot share all of those with you today, but I want to just share two opportunities and doors that I've seen in the last week. One of those, on Monday, I was talking with a member of our church. Her name is, is Lydia, um, and she is immunocompromised. She's actually been undergoing chemo, and so she's one of those people who really need to kind of stay away from others right now, and she's been kind of holed up in her house and getting antsy. And so she called the church office on Monday. She said, Pastor, I'm kind of going crazy, and I just, I want to help people. I want to do something. Is there anything I can do? 
And as she was talking, I remembered a conversation I'd had with Rocky at the food bank here in town. And they have a need for a Spanish-speaking translator because they've got more Spanish-speaking people coming through the food bank that sometimes they have a hard time communicating with right now. And guess who speaks Spanish? Mi hermana, Lydia. Uh Uh-huh. And so I kind of put this together. I said, well, what what if you somehow did that? Here's what we'll do. You can't be there because you need to stay at home and not be around people. So how about we give your number to Rocky, and anyone who comes through the line that needs to talk to someone who speaks Spanish, she can give the phone to them, and you could translate from the comfort and the safety of your own home. And Lydia just just jumped on it, right? And so that's just started this week. And I just thought, you know, Lydia could have just sat around and, and, and pouted and been frustrated at her circumstance. But instead, she was looking for God to open a door, right? She had the eyes to see it. And when it was there, she walked through it. I just think that's just remarkable, really. It's just so cool. The other thing that's happened actually relates more to just the general finances of our church, Um, If you're a member of our congregation, you're here all the time, I just want you to know God has been so gracious to us as a church throughout the years. And even in this season where we're not even gathering and we're not passing a plate, we're not doing these things, like God has faithfully provided for the needs of your church. And many of you have been faithfully giving, and that's a huge reason for why that is. And so I just started praying. I just, just trying to figure out, like, like, what would God want us to do with that? What would God want to do with his money? Because how many of you know that, that when God blesses you financially, it's not to raise your standard of living, it's to raise your standard of giving. And he has been just blessing us financially as a church. So I thought there's got to be a reason, there's got to be something we can do. And so I'm praying as I scroll Instagram. I don't know if you know that's possible. You can actually pray and scroll Instagram at the same time. I'm talented like that. And so I'm scrolling Instagram, and I see Kristen Bennett, whose family goes to our church, and she works at San Am Hospital in Staten. And so I just felt prompted to start praying for her and her coworkers that God would protect them as they serve the sick of our city. And then a few minutes later, um, I was praying again, and God brought Heather Anderson to mind, who's another healthcare worker. And we have many in our church, but Heather just kind of came to mind. And so I did the same thing. I started praying for her and I started asking God, like, what could our church do to let these people know that we're behind them, that, that there is a church family who, who believe in them and thank them for what they're doing, really putting their lives on the line every single day when they go to work right now. And I kid you not, like 30 minutes after that, a story popped up in my timeline of a church that was buying lunch for nurses and doctors. It was in Texas, I think it was. Maybe it was Florida, I can't remember now. And, and it was just instant. God just said, why can't you do that? And so I called Kristen, we started texting back and forth and, and Heather. And so this week, our church is gonna be buying lunch for about 50 nurses at San Am and State Hospital. Right, just a little thing. And, and again, there, there's lots of problems, no doubt about that, but there's also a lot of opportunities, little things we can do right now and walk through those doors to show people Jesus' love. And so let me just ask you this. What door might God have opened before you right now? Again, it's easy to look at all the problems, but I just want you to stop for a second and think, what opportunities has God placed before me right now in this season? And I'm praying you'll have the eyes to see him, and then I'm praying you'll have the courage to walk through him. Let's continue on. This is in verse 9 now of chapter 3. It says, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. You know, there are seven churches that Jesus writes to, and only two of them received no rebuke from Jesus. One of them was Smyrna, who we already talked about, and the other is here in Philadelphia. But he does have tough words here, but the tough words are not for the church. They're for another group of people that he calls the synagogue of Satan, right? That's that's pretty harsh. It's like easy there, right? Have you ever ever had a hard conversation and you described it, you told someone that you had to have a come to Jesus moment? This is literally Jesus calling his own come to Jesus, right? He's got something he needs to say 
And it's not to the Christians in the city. It's actually to a group of Jews who are being hostile to the message of Jesus and to the other Christians. See, um, the synagogue was where Jews would go to worship. It was their church. It's where they gathered for community, for study, for fellowship. It was a sacred place. More importantly, it was a safe place in Philadelphia. Because what had happened, um, the Jews in Philadelphia had been given a religious exemption from the Roman Empire. They were um, polytheistic, the Roman culture was. They worshipped many gods and they expected the citizens of Roman colonies to follow suit and worship many gods, one of whom was Caesar himself, right? Uh, Roman citizens were to declare that Caesar was Lord except the Jews were given an exemption. They were monotheists. They only believed in one God. But in Philadelphia, as long as the Jews behaved themselves, as long as they paid their taxes and were otherwise good citizens, the Romans would leave them alone and allow them to worship as they please. What had begun to happen um, is the Jews and Christians were no longer getting along. For a long time, they intermingled because they kind of came from the same background. The early Christian movement was, was basically a, a branch of Judaism. It was Jews who were coming to follow Jesus. And so they kind of intermingled. They agreed there was only one God. The problem was there's a group of Jews who got angry and began kicking the Christians out of the synagogue. You can't come here anymore. You can't worship here anymore. You're not one of us. And as word began to spread in the Roman colony, that Christians were not one with the Jews, they lost their exemption status. Suddenly that opened up Christians to persecution because Christians refused to declare that anyone was Lord besides Jesus. And so it put these Christians in kind of between a rock and a hard place. And so in this letter, Jesus is saying, I see what's happening. I see what's going on. I see what you're going through. And I have your back. He's telling this church, I have your back. One day, those who are persecuting you will be set straight. That is the the synagogue of Satan, as he calls them. And then here's the end of his letter, starting in verse 10. So since you have kept my command to endure patiently, we're going to come back to that, endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. For the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the phrase that jumps out at me, I mentioned earlier, is this idea where he says, you have endured patiently. I want you to think about this. You have endured patiently. They faced the uncertainty of earthquakes. They've been kicked out of the synagogues and persecuted. And yet they've endured. They've stood firm. Now, oftentimes when we hear that word, we think of it as as a passive thing, like to endure something means to just kind of roll with it and and let it happen to you. But that's not actually what the word means. The Greek there is the the word hupomone, which um, I I love William Barclay's take on this. Barclay defines it. He says, hupomone means to actively face the storm and stand firm in it. To actively face the storm and stand firm in it. That is what it means to endure patiently. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, uses the same word when it says that Jesus endured the cross. And let's just just get something straight here about that. Jesus endured the cross. No one did anything to Jesus that Jesus didn't let them. But he chose the cross. He went to Jerusalem and stare death in the face for you and me. And so as followers, we are called to become like Jesus, to take on his character and to learn how to endure, to, to actively face the storm 
and stand in it. Now, you may not feel like you're strong enough for that today. And I just want you to know that your strength as a Christian has very little to do with you and everything to do with who you are abiding in. Your strength comes from your connection to the vine. It comes from your connection to Jesus. And if Jesus is your everything, you can endure anything. If Jesus is your everything, you can endure anything. He says, I I hold the keys. I have all authority. I am in control. I alone open and close doors. And in this passage, Jesus says, I will make you a pillar, right? This stronghold, I will make you a pillar in the temple of God. So just hold on, he says. Just hold on. Just endure a little while longer. And in the meantime, Right, while you are enduring patiently, in the meantime, look for opportunities as much as you do the obstacles because there are open doors all around you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, if there's a word that describes how a lot of us are feeling in the middle of this COVID-19 situation, I think it would be uncertain. There's so much we don't know. There's so much out of our control. Every day it seems like things change. And we don't know what the plan is. But you came to this city who was in a similar situation, who was uncertain, who were being pressed and persecuted. You reminded them that you are the truth. We don't know what we can believe. We can hold on to you and that you hold all authority of the kingdom, and that if we will endure patiently, if we will stay close and abide in you, we can endure anything. I pray you would just remind us of that today, and you would press that deep into our souls. In your name, amen. Well, hey, make sure to check out the website for all of that stuff that we've got going on during Holy Week, starting today, Palm Sunday. Uh, Would love to see your 60-second testimony. And we will be right back here next Sunday to celebrate Easter together. So see you then.